Today we're talking about all the decisions you're going to be making for your new herd. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. John, we're talking uh, for genetic improvements. Right, we've talked about uh, the basic differences between purebred and crossbred cattle. Mm -hmm. The rest of the time today, I want to spend helping you identify the better cattle within each of those systems. Mm -hmm. We do have some tools available to us to help identify some of the better cattle. Okay. Uh, you know, over the years, we've seen a lot of different types. I mean, think about clothing or hairstyles. There's mm -hmm. been changes. Well, I'm going to graphically show you here in a couple pictures some of the changes. I mean, we're talking some cattle wow. here that over a century old, but, you know, those are older pictures, but if you saw them today, you'd say, oh, they look pretty good. But uh, in the middle part of the 1900s, uh, we went the other way. We made cattle smaller framed, mm -hmm. lower to the ground, and you can kind of see that was a popular style in the mid-50s. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of the people I've heard them referred to as belt buckle cattle. They didn't come much over your waist, right, and, right. And, and they are quite a bit smaller than their earlier ancestors. They and like any time else, we make changes. Yep. In the 60s, when I mentioned before that a lot of the continental breeds came in in the late 60s, early 70s, we saw cattle get bigger. So that was a, a painting of what was considered an ideal steer mm -hmm. in 1969. And then we go to the mid 80s when we had gone too far the other way. We made cattle really tall. Look at uh, how much daylight's underneath that black bull in the lower right hand corner compared to that little bull. Yeah, barely. I mean, we're talking. <coughs> Uh, Way difference. Roughly yeah. 35 years. Mm -hmm. Some people would say that was advancement. Other people would say that was going too far the other way. That's one thing that I've seen in my lifetime is cattle breeders can make change. It's a little slower. Our generation yeah. of rules are longer. But uh, we oftentimes go too far. Yeah. And now, then, go ahead. John, do we see um, the... Uh, do, you, do we see us going back down to shorter cows now? Not to the extreme we did in the 50s. Yeah. Actually, we do see weights heavier than ever, yeah. but we're trying to keep frame size okay. in control. So okay. it's, it's a, we're trying to use mm -hmm. genetics, and we'll talk about that here in a okay. second, about gotcha. to try to get to where we need to be. Now, also, I will tell you, we've got much more information than we did. You know, 1986 doesn't mm -hmm. seem uh, that long ago to me because that was the year I got married. Yeah, so that, it, yeah. it uh, does. Just the other day? Yeah, just the other day, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, there's been a lot of technological advances uh -huh. in the last uh, 30 plus years. Now today, we know this bull looks pretty good, but how good is he? You know, we can yeah. look at him and we have an idea, but mm -hmm. what's the genetics? What's under the hide, so to yeah. speak? Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about now. We have a tool called expected progeny differences, or EPDs. That's the industry slang. We talk about EPDs, and it's basically a number that expresses the difference between two animals. Mm -hmm. uh, when these databases started out, average was zero, but uh, uh, as time goes and we accumulate data, zero changes. It's not the average anymore. So, and, and I don't want to bore you with details, but basically every breed has their own set of EPDs, and we'll talk about how you can evaluate within a breed and between breeds here momentarily. Okay. They, these, this technology started in the 80s. Uh, in the early days, we just used progeny information. If you have Buster the bull and you want to know how good he is, we would measure Buster's progeny. We yeah. would weigh him, measure him, things like that, and that would give us a, a basic idea of how good or different he was than the average bull of whatever breed. Right. Uh, it was hard to do it on the younger stock because we were just starting to accumulate data. Mm -hmm. So it was generally on mature animals. Of course, just like a lot of things, computer technology advances and it allows us to do statistics that we couldn't do uh, previously. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically this new RAM model or the advanced computer model allows us to plug in ancestor information. You know, you and I are a product of okay. our parents and yeah. grandparents 
parents, and, yeah. and at least with livestock, we mm -hmm. can statistically analyze mm -hmm. weight data, a lot of different things mm -hmm. on different animals, and again, a lot of this is a result of computer technology. Okay. So what determines how quick we can make improvement in genetics? And I mentioned this earlier, a generation interval on cattle is a lot longer than our primary competition hogs, chickens, mm -hmm. rabbits, yeah. you think about how much yeah. longer. I you mentioned can... I mentioned earlier, it's 283 days gestation length, mm -hmm. and then usually it takes two years for a female to mature to be old enough to have a calf of her own. Okay. So from the time you, if you bred a cow today and you wanted no idea what kind of cow she's going to be, 283 days, it took 283 days for her to be born, yep. two years to become a cow, and then usually we wean her first calf at seven or eight months of age. So you add all that time up, it's over 1,200 days. Yeah. So it takes a while to figure takes some a, of yeah. this, this yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, genetic variation, there's a lot of variation between breeds, but there's even more variation within a breed. If you take the worst Angus to the best Angus, there's quite a bit of variation yeah. in a lot of different traits. Can do a lot about that, but you pick out what genetics you you like or can afford, and mm -hmm. you do the best job of improving it. How much selection pressure or intensity you put on, you know, are you really picky on fertility? In other words, if a, if a cow doesn't get bred, do you automatically cull her out of the herd? Mm -hmm. you, you do that year after year. Eventually, you will improve fertility. Okay. Get the low performers on whatever trait you want out, and get them out, and and that's what we call selection intensity or pressure. And then accuracy, are you using proven genetics or are you using um, the latest, greatest son of the proven bull? Gotcha. You, know, yep. you know something about the old bull, but you don't know as you much know. about the young bull. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that has accuracy, and sure. we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, today, this EPD is a combination of four distinct things, okay? Uh, the EPD, with is represented in the blue circle, the contributing factors, first of all, is pedigree. We talked about your lineage or your ancestry. That, uh -huh. obviously, is the foundation. Mm -hmm. Then performance. How did that animal itself perform? What was its birth weight, weaning mm -hmm. weight, yearling weight? What were, uh, you know, you, you weigh the animal, you do ultrasound to see what their carcass data looks like. That's the animal's actual performance. Mm -hmm. Then we have that animal's progeny. If it's a cow, her calves, or the bull, the, the calves that he sired. You yeah. know, we collect data that way and okay. then here in the last five to ten years uh, genomics have entered into it so we actually get DNA data now so these four main criteria go into the EPDs in almost all breeds today that gives us a I believe a much better EPD to work with mm -hmm. to decide okay is Buster better is old Mac better yeah. which which bull is better yeah. you know that's that's basically what this comes down to mm -hmm. now genomics what's fascinating this is data from the American Ag Association, if I pulled a DNA test yeah. on any given animal, PE stands for progeny equivalence. So if I pulled a DNA sample on Buster the bull, mm -hmm. it gives me, let's look at birth weight, the equivalent accuracy of 21 of his own calves. Wow. Scientists have figured out that when we weigh an animal, that's a snapshot of what he was that day. DNA is what's in his blood all of his life. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we accumulate more it's data, but that, that's the, the, all these different numbers. So you look here, uh, the trait that actually they feel, science feels like that uh, we get the most accuracy from is milk. It's the equivalent of 33 calves hmm. or daughters. Uh, weaning weight, 26. Uh, carcass weight, only nine. Look at the carcass traits. They're a little lower number than some yeah. of the other traits. So uh, this is stuff that uh, some of these this data is harder to accumulate. Uh, but you see this wide variety of traits. And, and uh, DNA's been around long enough. I know in our operation, we've got animals that are walking around today that we've had three or four generations of animals animals in that pedigree yeah. tested for mm -hmm. DNA. So the more you accumulate this data, you get more accuracy and more confidence in it. Mm -hmm. 
This is an example of a pedigree. Uh, this is a Angus bull, uh, and it tells you his age. There's a lot of information here. It uh, tells me that uh, the, when he was born, his parentage, you see that code there, that IG384, that's the code for the genetic test that they did on him. Yeah. Uh, he's actually had two done, uh, PF50 and IG384 are two different genomic tests. That bull's had 303 sons or daughters DNA tested. So this is the kind of information I'll look at. It's like, well, this bull's got a lot of information. Yeah. The EPDs are in those boxes down below. The pedigree is there, what you see in the middle. It tells me what his three-generation mm -hmm. parentage is. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you look at uh, the production traits. You have CED, which is Cavanese Direct, birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight. That first number is the actual EPD. It tells us that number may not mean anything to you, but I'll get to you where, where it gets important. The second number is the accuracy. 0.99 is the most it can be. So this is a proven bull. His number, a, an unproven yearling animal that's had a DNA test and weight data, just for perspective, mm -hmm. would be around a 0.3 accuracy, 0.3 to 0.4. So this tells me, just a quick look, that this bull's had a lot of data collected. Uh, the percent number, tells me what percentile he ranks. So for uh, birth weight, he's kind of average. He's in the 45th percentile. For yeah. weaning weight, he's a pretty good bull. He's in the top 10%. For yearling weight, he's even better. He's a third percent. And then the last number tells me how many calves have had that measurement turned in. So this is an hmm. example of a fairly proven bull, okay? okay. Yep. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of numbers here, and I'm just giving you the quick snapshot of it. Yeah. This is a percentile chart. It's like, think about you that have taken the ACT test or, or um, have children have taken it. You tell me you got a composite score of a 30 mm -hmm. on the ACT. Well, that tells me you're pretty smart. It yeah. tells me you did pretty good. Yeah. But if you tell me what percentile you're in, that tells me more. Yeah. You see uh, what I'm saying? I see. Yeah. So I understand that. every breed has these. Dwayne uh, has a percentile chart that tells you where they rank. So if I see a bull that's average on birth weight in the Angus breed, mm -hmm. he's a 1.3. You see 50th percentile, 1.3. If he was average weaning weight, WW would be 53. So that's how you would read these charts. So if you're looking to okay. make advancement, if you're, say, your herd has too much birth weight and you want to improve it, you may be looking at the top 10 or 20 percent bulls. So this will help you make your genetic decisions. This is available in all breeds and there across the bottom, you see what's average. So if you're looking at a bull in a bull stud catalog or a sale catalog, mm -hmm. you can quickly look at that and say, okay, this bull's average or he's above average or below average. So okay. th this is just a tool to help you identify identify better genetics. There's differences between breed, and they base Angus because they, they have the most data. So if you want to compare a Hereford bull to an Angus bull, and you see an Angus bull's birth weight EPD is a 2.0, a comparable Hereford bull would be 3.4. You add that number to the Angus number, to, to compare between breeds. So, like I said, I, I just picked out birth weight, 2.0. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So a Hereford bull that's equal to that Angus bull would be a 3.4. A red Angus bull would be 4.6. And, and so on. So you add the add or subtract these numbers to compare them to an Angus bull. Okay. And again, I'm giving you a real quick thumbnail sketch. Again, I've mentioned mm -hmm. the Beef Improvement Federation. This data is there. Gotcha. Okay. We have now selection indexes. We actually have indexes that combine traits. We and we'll talk about those. I know you saw that paper. There's all kinds of numbers on that page. Mm -hmm. It makes it hard to to sort all that data out. So different breed associations have developed what we call selection indexes to help simplify this process. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, they're weighted and they are related to an economic value. So if you're talking about pounds, we know what cattle sell for, we put a dollar figure to it. If we know what carcasses are, for, are worth, we put values to that. And this, again, can be used just like EPDs to put selection pressure as you're making mating decisions. And again, these selection indexes are basically more for the commercial producer than for the purebred because they 
can be overwhelmed looking at all these EPDs. Gotcha. Angus, we have dollar W, which is weaning, birth weight, things like that. Mm -hmm. Dollar beef is more after weaning index. Simmental has what they call API and TI. Again, API would be kind of an all around index. TI would be comparable to Angus's dollar beef, mm -hmm. post weaning traits. If you're a commercial guy and you don't want to look at many EPDs, you maybe look at these numbers and make your decision a little quicker. Gotcha. Okay, that's just a quick and dirty uh, overview of all this. Uh, every breed has these inf this information. Some breeds have more numbers, some have less. Mm -hmm. But I would encourage producers, if you're trying to make decisions on what bull to buy this spring or what bulls to use artificially, mm -hmm. it's the kind of information you want to use. Again, I'd encourage you to go to our Beef Team website to check out uh, all of our different resources at beef.osu.edu. Again, John, always great information, lots of things about the, uh, the breeding season and such. Remember to go to the website. Uh, we'll see everybody next time.